Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started right on time because we have a lot of material to cover, a lot of technical material to cover, and we really would like to open up to a dialogue. And because this is a nice, intimate group, I think you know, many of you will have a chance to have your questions or comments included in the, in the dialogue. I'm, real, I'm Mariana Grossman. I'm the founder of Minerva Ventures, and we work on climate adaptation solutions and um, planning and strategy. And so I'm ex especially excited to have a panel on this topic because when I listen to people talking about climate change and climate change plans, typically they're talking about reducing greenhouse gas emissions or mitigation. And that assumes that uh, there, I mean, it needs to be done, but there's sort of an underlying uh, assumption that I hear sometimes behind people's discussions that there's a big light switch in the sky, and if we suddenly could bring our greenhouse gas emissions down, then all the consequences of climate change, come on in, there's plenty of seats, all the consequences of climate change would magically be handled. And unfortunately, geophysical systems work on a really long time scale. And when you have melting glaciers and things like that, uh, it's going to take quite a while for the climate system to adjust. So we have some wonderful experts, and um, two of whom I met last year working with uh, a committee or, or a technical advisory group organized by Governor Brown's Office of Planning and Research on climate adaptation for the state of California. So we have Guido Franco, who works for the California Energy Commission and is their resident climate expert and um, Lewis Blumberg from the Nature Conservancy was also on that, uh, on that group. And Jess, sorry, did I? Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, and Jessica Fox, who is a sustainability <laughs> leader for the Electric Power Research Institute, sort of representing the bigger um, electric utility industry. So I, I'm really excited about having gathered people with so much expertise and from complementary um, points of view. So you're in for a treat. This chart I found on the current NASA website. And this is, um, you can see that the um, current, the uh, CO2 levels are essentially going, looks like almost straight up when you look at that kind of um, over hundreds of thousands of years trajectory. We're really in a period of discontinuous change. And if you look at the global average temperatures that kind of map that, um, they also go almost straight up, and then you can see that dotted orange line I put in there. What's going to happen to that curve? Is it going to keep going straight up, or are we going to bend it over? And as temperatures increase, there are all kinds of consequences that ensue, and those are things like heat and fire and drought or torrential rain, other kinds of changes in the hydrological system and weather patterns. And um, those, those kinds of things all have an impact on our energy system, and that's really what we're gonna be addressing today. So what are the impacts we're seeing right now? Like we had the Rim Fire uh, recently in Yosemite that um, had an impact on transmission lines. Um, there are new impacts coming, what are those? How do we build more resilience? How do we pre prepare for shocks and breakdowns in our energy system caused by these climate impacts? And then how can the grid address things like rising temperatures and extreme weather? And our panelists will talk about what some of those impacts are on our energy system. And can renewables and energy efficiency increase resilience? And how can we factor in impacts into that? When we talk about projecting renewables portfolio and demand standards, typically that's done assuming weather as usual. And we know we aren't going to have weather as usual. So that's what really what we're digging into is going in eyes wide open, what, what are we going to do to be able to have a more resilient future and how do we help protect the energy system and take advantage of innovation to, to make this process successful. So our panel I have introduced and I'm going to turn it over first to Guido. Okay. Wow, I got sound. No way. Okay, where's he? Come up here. I think I close that. And then I go to, okay, here we go. Always te technologists here. <laughs> okay, this and then we want all the time. Oh, okay, perfect. Is that? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. 
Okay, thank you very much. Can I use this? Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. So what I'm going to do is to talk about what the state of California is doing to prepare the energy system for a changing climate. So the outline of my presentation, I want to give you a very brief historical perspective. Uh, then I forgot to add in a slide about the California Fourth Assessment, but I will just mention what it is and what we're doing very briefly. And then I will talk about a new group that was formed like about a year and a half ago, the CPUCCC Adaptation Working Group, and then I briefly discuss what is next. So with respect to research, I mean, the California Energy Commission has been a sponsor of climate change research since the early 2000s. Uh, we had a vast portfolio of research on climate change. As far as I know, it's the only state-sponsored uh, regional research program in the nation and has been there for a long, long time. Uh, and the idea is to provide information that will inform uh, climate policy in California. For example, our 2006 California climate assessment was in influential in the, on the passage of AB32. The law that requires emission reductions in California. And our most recent work has been very influential in the passage of, uh, I think, three or four bills mandating adaptation in California. So let's now talk about the impacts of climate change to the energy system. So the Energy Commission has sponsored research on how climate change, in this case hot temperatures, will affect the electricity system. And we started with a, looking at how if we superimpose the climate of the end of the century to the system of today, what would have been the consequences? So. Uh, high temperatures will decrease the efficiency of power plants, or thermal power plants, will decrease the efficiency of PVs, it will uh, decrease the efficiency of, uh, of transformers, et cetera, et cetera. It will increase electricity demand. The bottom line is that if we have the climate of the future superimposed now to what we have, we need to increase the number of power plants by about 30%. So that's a huge increase. We also look at hydropowers. So we have several studies on hydropower units using engineering methods, statistical methods, et cetera, et cetera. And the bottom line is that climate change will shift the hydrology you know, in such a way that we will have less generation available from hydropower in the summer and the spring when we need it the most, and more generation in the winter with a lot of spillage with potential problems with for flooding. With the natural gas system, we funded a project uh, from, uh, with Professor Ratke uh, looking at the potential vulnerability of the natural gas infrastructure that we have in the Delta to sea level rise. And working very closely with PGE, they found some vulnerabilities. The good news is that they have time, PGE have time to take care of those vulnerabilities. Coastal impacts, the same thing. Uh, uh, I mean, the first work by Pacific Institute in 2009 sound the alarm, uh, sounded the alarm that we have a lot of problems with the expected uh, increases in sea level rise. In this case, it's showing uh, substations but that could be flooded. But we also have problems with power plants, et cetera, et cetera. Wildfires, the same thing. We have a study by Professor Westerling from UC Merced looking how climate change will impact wildfires. At the time, in 2003, when we had the first study, nobody believed it. Now, obviously, the evidence is in front of us. So, and the, so, the, the, so the, what he showed is that, uh, well, uh, uh, what we found is that our transmission lines are vulnerable to wildfires and uh, that vulnerability will increase dramatically with the changing climate. So, so let, before I talk to, about this, let me just briefly talk about the California climate assessment, the next one that I will submit it to the governor and the legislature in 2018. So we have like 15 projects looking at the vulnerability of the energy system, not only electricity, natural gas, also the petroleum system to climate change, but more importantly, how to adapt. 
And, and, uh, and also, we are abandoning just the idea of looking at the end of the century. We are looking now at what will happen in the next 37 years to 2050. And that's important because the chairman ordered us to, the CDC chairman, to, to find out what we need to do now in order to protect the energy assets in the next 35 years. Um, the, uh, maybe I should stop there. But uh, now going back to the talk, uh, uh, I mean, there is a working group that was formed by the CPUC and CEC. It's co-chaired by the chairman, chairman Weiss Miller and the CPUC Commissioner Randolph. That also includes representatives from the Natural Resources Agency, uh, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, and the Office of Emergency Services. So they meet, uh, we meet uh, every quarter uh, to coordinate our respective activities with respect to climate adaptation. There is going to be an IPER workshop. IPER is the Integrated Energy Policy Report that will be uh, held uh, August 29th uh, this year to talk more about this. Uh, so this is a good, uh, I mean, it gives you an indication that energy agencies are taking climate change very seriously, but more importantly, that all the horrible things that you may see in the news, that will be, there will be blackouts everywhere because of climate change. Okay, our job is to make sure that that doesn't happen, that our, we will protect our energy infrastructure uh, for the benefit of California. So what is DEX? Uh, so before we were funding research to show that we had a problem to solve. Now we have shown them, I mean, the energy utilities realized that that's the case. They have submitted comments to, into the public record saying, hey, we're willing to work with the energy agencies uh, to solve this problem. Uh, but, uh, uh, but now it rep actually, it, uh, we're now in the case that we need to provide information or research results that are actionable, that the electric utilities that electricity ratepayers can use to actually adapt to a changing climate. Uh, and that's more difficult because in the case of the IOUs, we need to work very closely with them. And these rep represent problems. For example, our researchers will need to get data and access perhaps to confidential information from the utilities. Uh, uh, so one solution is, like we have done it before, the researchers could work directly with the utilities, access confidential information, but when they send the report to us, we don't see the confidential information. So the, conf the information that goes to the public in, our, in, in their research products uh, will not contain confidential information, but describe in an understandable way, you know, the. Uh, the potential impacts and how those impacts could be alleviated. Um, the, I mean, is it possible that research results could inform great cases in the future when the utilities go before the California Public Utilities Commission to ask for funding for uh, adaptation, to implement adaptation measures? And I mean, this is also becomes very difficult when the, for research because now we are not talking just about paper being published in scientific journals, we are now are talking about billions of billions of dollars to adapt to a changing climate. So thank you very much, and my good friend Max is there. Um, I love him very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, I am from the Electric Power Research Institute, and just to clarify, we do not represent the electric power industry. We are not a power company ourselves. We are a nonprofit research institute that's really independent of the electric power companies. Um, I'm going to kind of take this up a, a notch here in terms of perspective for a few minutes, and then we can discuss further when we get to the to the Q and A session. 
Resiliency is, is, a, is a huge word, and, um, and it can be fairly nebulous, uh, kind of similar in my mind when we say sustainability. Sustainability is a gigantic umbrella term. Um, so when we talk about resiliency, and as we work with power companies and with communities and stakeholders, it's useful to kind of get our hands around this term a little bit and define it more specifically. So we heard today about the cyber, uh, cyber risk, potentially. So resiliency could be related to infrastructure or lines and poles in the electric power system. We talk a lot about these you know, toothpicks that are still sticking up to run of all of our kilowatt hours through the whole system versus underground. Um, ecological resiliency obviously is extremely important and has been the focus of much of the meeting so far. And Lewis um, Bloomberg is going to cover the ecological aspect in more detail right after me. So I'm not going to cover that so much. We also need to think about business resiliency. So at the end of the day, um, there probably is going to be a matchup between regulation, so the hammer coming down, with um, business um, incentives for companies to either keep doing what they're doing or to change their decisions and kind of ch and, and change their path. Um, so these kind of things, infrastructure, business, ecological, these are all sort of different elements and perspectives on resiliency and how you handle these things are gonna be really different depending on what you're talking about. Sort of similar to the three pillars of sustainability, right? environmental, economic, and social. These kind of things, they all have aspects to them that are fairly complex, and honestly, we'll probably have trade-offs between meeting business resiliency and social resiliency and so forth. So let's talk about this a little bit more. As we think about the future power system and where we're going kind of in, as, as we look forward, we're on this cusp of this really you know, monumental shift in how the electricity system is managed, their environmental footprint, how it's set up. And there's so many aspects to it, including, um, of course, customer expectations and demands, what shareholders expect from companies that they invest in? What are investors expecting of the power companies that they're putting their money into? Of course, there's a huge energy water interface and nexus um, that is already here and will continue to become more important as we go forward. So this interplay is something that EPRI's been working on for quite a while, thinking about this integrated energy network, the integration of many different systems, electricity, gas, water, thermal, and also the integration of how ecological considerations fit into this new system. Within this is gonna be this two-way flow of electrons. It's something that hasn't been there you know, in, the, in this kind of real old school traditional industry, power plants, where the power plant did all this work and got it to your plug. And you put in your plug, you got power at the plug. It's what, it's what socially was expected what was demanded was power at the plug at a predictable price. But now we're seeing that this two-way flow of electrons where I have solar panels on my house, I generate power, it goes back to the grid. So what's gonna happen here in terms of resiliency? The stability of the grid, the prediction around those kilowatt hours being available when you plug your, when you, when you uh, put your light in the wall, um, and then how do we use systems to sort of back up this intermittent kilowatt hour delivery from solar, for example? So these are kind of things we need to sort of be thinking about when we're talking about resiliency in addition to ecological considerations here. So to kind of bring this down a little bit in a, in a more statistical basis, lots of people do these predictions about the fuel mix of the future. Really, you really need to be thinking, and these are the types of graphs. So when you look at a chart like this, um, all of these different colors are related to different uh, trade-offs and consequences. So there was just this huge debate about gas, right, that we just heard. Boy, that was an active debate, right, over lunch. So looking at the power system of the future, what is the fuel mix at the end of the day? And here's just an example. 
This is this is based on current a uh, current expectation or or a, assumption around the price of natural gas. If it's two dollars and fifty cents um, as a flat natural gas price, the economic and predictive models would show well by 2050 we're going to have a lot of natural gas out there. Uh, it's going to be pretty big. This is from an EPRI model called Regen. It's it's run on a national level. If you just change one element of the model, the price of natural gas, and you bump it up to $10, you can see now instead of that huge swath prior, it's now a pretty small slice. Wind has popped up. You see a little bit more solar. Coal is, is still staying pretty steady here. So this is just one piece. This is pure, you know, there's boundaries on this model. In this case, you changed one variable, the price of natural gas, right? What's not considered here and not reflected in this model that does need to be considered are what about those ecological assets? Is your access to water stable? Are your impacts to habitat and biodiversity being appropriately considered and managed here? So these other risk factors are not taken into account. On projections of solar, have we thought about, for example, the impacts of, of solar fields on pollinator habitat? Pollinators, we need pollinators, right? Our food supply, our social stability depends on pollination services. So it's, this is a complex sort of analysis that has to be done when we're thinking about resiliency of our systems as we go forward with meeting the expectation that we have power, right? It's a social, it's a social expectation that we have power at the plug. So EPRI has a series of, of white papers, which you're welcome to go and, and look at. And we look at it from, the, from a mashup of, of resilient, flexible, and connected. So these are some of the things that we consider. So when you're thinking about this resiliency piece, it is, uh, the equation is, what's your resiliency risk? It is a combination of your probability of a hazard occurring times your consequence. So what's your vulnerability? What's your exposure to it? So this is kind of a, the deeper set of research that you have to think about. When you're managing risk and resiliency, you, know, you need to know your boundaries around what's your vulnerability. Are you thinking about pollinators? And then your hazard there is, for example, use of pesticides. And then your resiliency risk would be considered. Or do you have something else sort of on your mind here? So a chapter that was in a book that we published last year, a very enjoyable read, I might add, has five stars on Amazon.com if anybody would like to go and get it. Um, one of the chapters, um, these are case studies from electric power companies. Uh, chapter eight, Entergy wrote a chapter on climate change resiliency and adaptation. So Entergy faced this huge issue uh, around Hurricane Katrina. Power loss for 1.1 million people, destroyed homes of around 275,000 destroyed homes. So what were they gonna do? They were on deck to figure out something, to restore power, to help their communities. And it says the storms and their aftermath provided a clear business case for Entergy to forecast and mitigate climate-related risks. And they went forward and they identified elements of the risk what, how do you peel apart those elements and put it together in sort of a plan for understanding how you're doing? We also manage this energy sustainability interest group. This is the largest group of any industry that is working collaboratively together to think about issues related to this big bucket of word sustainability. The work in this group um, goes from peeling apart what are your issues here what are sustainability issues? How do you know how mature you are in managing those issues? Do you have metrics to measure how you're doing? You can benchmark against your peers and then you use that information to engage stakeholders. So I just kind of twi quickly took you around this wheel. So in our research, just that's not published yet, but will be published by the end of this year, the question about an issue. We have 15 sustainability priority issues that have been identified. Out of about 450 issues that stakeholders and NGOs and CDP and GRI were all requesting disclosures on, we got them down, narrowed it down to what they really were asking for is 15 issues in 2012. Resiliency wasn't on there. 
climate was on there, but not resiliency as a separate topic. We just refreshed this and now resiliency is its own topic in there. So it's not just part and parcel to climate. And that's kind of one of my points. You could be thinking about other aspects of resiliency you need to think about. So then the question comes, if it's defined as its own issue, how do you measure it? How does a power company go about making sure they are resilient, that they are being responsive to this issue? What are their things they should measure? What are their metrics? Should they have a strategy on resiliency? Is that enough? Or do they need to actually be going getting quantified numbers like Entergy is, is now doing? Um, so these are some of the questions. And um, further from that, well, we have a sustainability maturity model. There's different domains to it, water, greenhouse gas, affordability, reliability. We're looking at building out one for resiliency where companies can go and assess how mature are they related to a particular topic. Um, so these are all things that are sort of on the cusp of, um, of work that Upri's doing and the industry is thinking about doing. Um, and so when we go back and we start kind of thinking about this and what's the quantitative research that we're doing, we know we need to be thinking about what's the audience of concern how are companies going to think and measure this for themselves? What's the boundary? And clarify really this definition of resiliency. Because it's not only just, re, um, it's not always being resistant to unpredictable storm events, for example, or unpredictable fire events. There's other aspects to this topic that are going to be important to keep on the table and make sure we're kind of, when I say resilient, it's the same thing that you hear. And when you're thinking about it, you know, we're talking the same language, which um, there's some reasonable concern that that's not necessarily happening right now. So, what's that? Well, good afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to thank Mariana for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel today and, and for the organizers of this conference. It's been really great so far. Um, so I'm Lewis Bloomberg. I'm the uh, leader of the California Climate Change Program for the Nature Conservancy. How many of you have heard of the Nature Conservancy? <laughs> good. Okay. We're doing well uh, on that. Um, so on Halloween of 2015, Governor Brown declared a state of emergency in our forests. Because of climate change, and there's documented science now to support this, because of the increased temperature and the extended drought, we had a huge die-off of trees. Um, and scientists today estimate there's 102 million dead trees in our forests, and that, comp that produces, holds about 89 million metric tons of carbon. Hmm. That's 19% of the standing above ground carbon in the state. This is a huge problem. Um, and it's a huge threat um, to the, the, the atmosphere from the carbon loss and to the transmission of electricity. And what I'm going to talk about is this nexus between nature uh, and climate uh, and the role with the energy sector here. Um, so at the Nature Conservancy, we've been looking at, at different ways to address climate change where you call it using the term natural climate solutions. And I was really pleased that Jonathan Pershing this morning mentioned the role of land use and land use change uh, in the global climate uh, um, debate because it's the sector that is often overlooked. It's hard to measure uh, changes from the, from the land use, uh, from the land base. And um, so it's really important that it's be included in the conference. I'm glad he mentioned it and I'm glad I'm having the opportunity to talk about it here and now. So, Mariana talked about mitigation and adaptation. I'd like to offer another frame to look at, at, at climate action uh, through, the nature, through the lens of nature, through using nature to address climate change. And when you use nature to address climate change, you can all, often make progress on all three key strategies. You can reduce and avoid the emissions of greenhouse gases. You can restore carbon, put it back on the earth where it came from and you can enhance resilience and reduce climate magnified risk. And when you do that, you get a whole suite of other benefits. Um, 
which is p why nature is a very powerful tool to address climate change. So I want to talk real briefly about reducing emissions uh, and avoiding emissions. And we just completed an analysis and submitted it uh, for publication uh, that shows that, in fact, we can use nature to pr produce at least 13% of the greenhouse gas reduction emissions that are necessary to meet California's 2030 emission reduction target. This is the first time that we've been able to come up with the number. Hmm. The state has not done that, uh, a number for the land sector. So this is really important work, and I, I wanted to highlight that. Um, and now I'm going to move more uh, to talk more about uh, risk reduction and resilience. So these are pictures of four th uh, threats that we have historically faced in California. Uh, these threats are all magnified by um, climate change. Uh, the frequency and severity of these extreme events is predicted to increase, and a lot of the research that the, the Energy Commission has funded had, has shown us this. Uh, and they're all, they're all uh, threats for which nature can be part of the solution set. It may not be the only one, surely not. It may not be the, the one you choose every time, Sur uh, surely not. But it is a part of, of, of the toolbox. So, so with wildfire, Okay, so with wildfire, is there a pointer? Okay, well. No. There wasn't a pointer. No, there's no pointer. Okay, so with wildfire, we can do ecosystem-based forest management to reduce the, the, the intensity of wildfire. Uh, with sea level rise, coastal hazard, storm surge, here wetland restoration, moving buildings back can help protect uh, from those threats. Um, we've, we know with floods, we saw this with Orville, that our infrastructure is very much at risk. Um, a levee setbacks, uh, reconnecting floodplains, those kind of activities can help deal with, with uh, floods. Uh, and groundwater recharge uh, and forest management can help with drought. There's also urban heat is a big problem. And we have people dying this week in California from high heat. We're going to see more extreme heat events, and it's, it's, it, right now it's happening. So, so there you can use urban forestry and urban greening can help mitigate the heat island effect. So these are just some of the, uh, the, the uh, threats that nature can help uh, ameliorate. So natural uh, climate solutions are familiar. If you drive to uh, Sacramento on Highway 80, and if you've done that uh, in this past winter, you saw the Yoho Bypass. It's been in place for many years. It's a flood risk reduction project uh, to protect Sacramento from floods. So we know there, and we know through other analyses, that natural climate solutions work. They are proven. They're flexible. They avoid, um, they keep you from avoiding future options. Um, they're cost effective even without factoring in the dollar value of the, of the co-benefits. Uh, they can avoid the greenhouse gas emissions that you get from uh, pouring concrete, and they pr pr provide a suite of multiple benefits. Here, habitat for the Pacific Flyway for birds, uh, recreation, um, and economic benefits from the leasing of land to farmers for rice in, in certain times of the year. So how are we doing? Well, uh, Guido mentioned that the, the passage of laws. Uh, in the eight years I've been working on this, I've seen a, a really a, a growth in, in California's response uh, or its <coughs> efforts to develop adaptation policy and plans. And when I started eight years ago on this topic, resilience was not the term. People didn't use that term. It was all adaptation. So that's happened in the last maybe six years, five, six years. So California has done a lot. With The state has passed several bills and can talk about those in more detail. Governor Brown issued an executive order that... Uh, for the first time dealt with climate adaptation and put the adaptation and the mitigation together. Uh, we've worked on the, on the budget to help fund the research, uh, to help uh, uh, the Coastal Commission develop uh, coastal plans with climate change considerations. Um, we're working on some of the research from the fourth climate assessment that Guido mentioned, as are others. And then planning, I, I left that for last. The, the uh, Natural Resources Agency is accepting comments today on its Safeguarding California plan. It has a section on the energy sector, and I would call your attention to it and urge you to submit your comments on that as well. So things are developing. So what are our objectives at the Nature Conservancy? I think they're really, they're, I know they're very clear. We want consideration of climate change to become standard business practice in government at all levels. 
And I think the business community, many, are already recognizing this and they're factoring this in because they see it affects their bottom line. But governments have been slower to take this up. So we want consideration to be standard business practice. We also want to create a preference for natural climate solutions where they make sense. And I'm really pleased that some of the laws and plans and policies that the state has do in fact have that preference. Um, so that's been helpful. So what's the connection to the energy section? energy sector around resilience in nature. We talked uh, initially about transmission, the reliability of power that can be disrupted from wildfire. That's come up uh, several times here, here today. Uh, we've talked about uh, increased demand from high heat. Well, that is gonna uh, exacerbate the heat island effect um, in our cities. And again, urban forestry and urban greening can help with that. Um, nature can help with cost containment for the energy sector in many ways. One of those would be just by providing forest carbon offset credits in California's <coughs> climate regulatory program for the utilities to purchase so they can achieve their emission reduction requirements at the lowest cost to them and to the ratepayers. Um, a lot can be said about employer safety from fire and high heat as well as ratepayer well-being. This is where nature can can help the sector in that way. And then finally, in the, in the siting of facilities, especially renewable facilities. So for example, the, the Nature Conservancy worked for a couple of years to help with, um, with partners to develop the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan, DRECP. This plan has been accepted by the BLM uh, and, and uh, the state's looking at portions of it. And what it does, it identifies low conflict zones. It looks at the conservation values uh, in the California desert and say where should the transmission and uh, renewable facilities be uh, to minimize conflict and therefore to uh, facilitate the, the permitting process. So that's a w one way that, that, that um, nat natural climate solutions can going to help with supply. So there's a lot of ways here. There, this, this, this connection, I think, is very strong between natural climate solutions and resiliency in the energy sector. And then there's one uh, example, I think, we're, that we saw. Uh, we developed a web-based decision support uh, tool to look at coastal inundation in Ventura County. This is a place where Entergy uh, has two power plants that are once through cooling plants that both need to be either retrofitted or replaced. Uh, and the Oxnard, uh, Planning Department and then Oxnard City Council did some analysis with the, with the tool and found that, that while these are plants are already in the flood zone, they would be further, the risk of inundation would be much greater in, uh, going forward in, the, uh, in a climate change future. So the Oxnard City Council put a moratorium on, on power plants along the coast right now in Ventura County. Mm -hmm. So is the energy sector resilient? That was the question that posed. Uh, I think that, that um, it's hard to say. As Jessica talked about, it's really hard to measure that. Probably not yet, but I would say we've already heard that it's, we're on our way. Uh, there's progress is being made. Um, and I think that's exciting. And I think that the, our natural resources have a critical role in, uh, uh, to play in, in achieving that resilience for the future. And ultimately, the, the energy system is one of the systems that are, that are all interconnected here that provide the, a life on the planet. Um, and it's well, it's connected with the ecosystem, um, which is, is very much threatened uh, by what's happening. And so um, the, the challenge of, of climate change is the challenge for our generation, uh, and it will be the legacy that we leave to the next generations and those to come. Thank you. the prerogative of the moderator to ask a couple of questions and and then open it up to all of you because I, I imagine you have uh, things on your mind. And I would like to um, actually start with Lewis. Um, one of the things I learned from you in the last year on the Climate Adaptation Task Force was really understanding what does natural infrastructure mean. So can you give, you had a kind of a range from nature itself to more constructed kinds of things. Could you just give a few examples of what you mean? Well, there, there has often been this sort of dialectic between built infrastructure or hard infrastructure and natural or green infrastructure. And we look at it as a spectrum. 
uh, and starting with conservation as, as, the, as the, the, the most protective and the less disruptive uh, strategy. Um, so then you get into to, to mixed programs where you would build a, a levee setback. You can move a levee back, you use equipment to, to move some earth, but then you replant the, the, uh, the floodplain with vegetation. You get some carbon benefits, some wildlife benefits. So that's a mixed, um, mixed effort. Um, an, an action like uh, beach replenishment uh, would be even more aggressive using machines to move sand down the beach to compensate for sand that's been eroded. Um, and then further out, um, um, is would be what's, what's, what we're looking for a new name, maybe we'll crowdsource this. It's been called managed retreat uh, or relocation. It's moving facilities that that's the sort of the last result. Um, and then finally would be you know building new levees and, and new piers and, and uh, rock revetments and, and seawalls, which would be hard infrastructure and beyond at the end of this, this spectrum there. So it's a green to gray spectrum, if you will. Thank you. And, and Jessica, can you talk a little bit more about um, how the um, EPRI is helping facilitate dialogue and learning among the electrical utilities and kind of cross-pollinization from different states and regions? How does that work? Sure, yeah. Um, and actually, we just launched a pollinator initiative yesterday, so the buzzword catches my ear a little bit on the cross-pollination piece. <laughs> um, so we, uh, we have a number of projects that are related to this. Um, we have projects that are focused on the, the engineering, kind of the grid hardening piece of it, where you're talking about making sure the grid infrastructure itself is, is resilient. You know, when storms come through or you get that squirrel with those big teeth that come chew through your line like we saw at lunch, you know, are you resilient to those kinds of things? Um, and then in our environment sector, we have, we have a whole, a whole uh, collaborative research um, effort talking specifically about climate change. So the focus of this meeting is, you know, seems to be focused on the climate change piece and impacts to ecosystems and so forth. So we have a whole a whole project on that as well. So we have we have a few different things, but I, I guess for APRI we 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 isolate the, you know, if it's grid infrastructure, that's with those engineering guys. If it's climate change and resiliency like Lewis is talking about, that's actually in my sector and that's what we focus on. So, you know, these kind of different perspectives, we also look at social pieces within our sustainability program. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And um, one another thing that struck me in the last year is that California is using a, a variety of climate models to be able to predict what's likely to happen under different scenarios. And I think that probably most enterprises, businesses, school districts, local governments, regional governments, really don't have the capacity to maybe even know what a climate model is, much less use the data provided by them. So what is the CEC doing to help people understand climate models and use them in their planning process? Well, in 2000, um, I think eight, uh, with Amy Lewis, uh, Stanford alumni, and uh, by then she was uh, with Google. Uh, so we had a partnership between the Energy Commission and Google uh, to develop a, a web-based uh, tool that is called CalAdapt, where you can go and type your address and it has the climate projections for your specific uh, others, or home or business, or you can do it for uh, your uh, territory. If you are a kind of you, you want so. Um, and the reason we started this beca was because uh, the Energy Commission has been contributing to the overall research portfolio, developing. California-specific downscaling techniques that takes the outputs of the global climate models that are two cores for California to, to find out how climate will be affected in California in relatively small, uh, with high geographical resolution. So we're talk talking about uh, three or four miles, uh, so squares of three or four miles. That, uh, that's the level of resolution that we are using and at a daily time steps. Uh, so, 
So we have this wealth of data, but in the scientific reports, we could only publish one or two figures. Uh, so we did, uh, with Amy's inspiration, you know, we decided to explore this option, and it has been a huge, huge success. And now we are worried that it may be too successful <laughs> because there are local entities that just go uh, take the image from Caladab and post them in their climate adaptation plan. Mm. And it's a tool that is easy to use and all of that, but we don't have the resources to also provide technical support. I mean, the ideal situation would be not only to have the tool, but also uh, technical support to make sure that people are using the tool correctly. So we, uh, yeah. But I think it was worthwhile. Uh, we are uh, gonna be released the new version of Caladap in the next few months. Uh, so there will be much uh, additional features including new climate projections for California that are being used for the next California assessment. By the way, um, this is like kind of advertising. Uh, so four years ago, we decided that the downscaling techniques that we were using were not good enough. So we contracted with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography to develop a new downscaling technique that is called LOCA. In Spanish, it's crazy woman, uh, <laughs> but it's actually it's, uh, uh, local analogs, and it's doing very, very well. Um, the federal government saw that we were doing, um, did some testing, and at the end, they decided to deploy local at the national scale. The beauty for us is that when we look at impacts for California, now, now also we can look at what, hap what will happen in, outside California to for, for better integration and interpretation of our results. And, and you may not like me with it, asking this follow-up, but if someone were really enterprising and they wanted technical help, are there people at the CEC or their local universities, or like who would they go to for expertise on, on climate modeling? Well, uh, for climate modeling per se, but not necessarily for Caladab, uh, I mean, all local universities in Stanford, for, for example, have Professor uh, Noah Diffenbaugh. Diffenbaugh. Yeah, uh, so every university uh, now has an expert on uh, climate projections for California. So I'm sure they will be happy to help. Great. Okay, I'm, I have other questions, but I want to open it up to all of you. What we have this wonderful set of experts here. What questions do you have about climate impacts on our energy system and how well prepared we are to address them? Jim. Yeah, I have a question more for uh, Louis. Uh, I, oh, yeah. oh, thank you. Thank you. Things you talk about seem to go right on to me. What you didn't spend as much time talking about is the counterproductive laws and regulations that we have that are getting in the way. Uh, I just illustrate this uh, radio story I was listening to. There was floods in the Russian River, and radio, the, the interviewer was talking to this woman whose house had been just flooded out and saying, oh, what's happened? It's, it's so terrible. She said, yeah, it's terrible. It's just been flooded out. She said, but what's going to happen? She said, well, the state pays the cost, so I'm going to rebuild just like the, I did the last three times. <laughs> and, and I said, now, wait a minute. It's, it's the financial incentives and the insurance are really not, in some sense, taking into account um, the need for the strategic withdrawal, the strategic for putting our people out of harm's way. And one of the things that are happening now to help correct some of those difficulties. I just, but I, I, I think this is like the third rail topic because it brings up managed retreat and FEMA will keep bailing people out in flood zones and people rebuild there. So. You did mention that, that idea a little. I'd love you to dig a little deeper into when do we decide that we don't reinvest in infrastructure where it used to be? 
Well, this is a big topic, and it's a, a new topic. And a couple of things. First of all, FEMA, the federal government, requires that you rebuild in the same place. So we did this repetitive loss analysis that showed they were paying for, to, re, uh, to, to replace homes in the same place over time, in places that were surely going to flood again. So that has been a FEMA issue we have not been able to address. We did work uh, with um, um, across the aisle with some um, um, conservative members of Congress and, and a big stakeholder group to revise the federal flood insurance program for the coast. The, right now, the federal government insures homes along the coast where they cannot get private insurance. Um, and uh, it, the rates are really low. They're below market rates. It's a subsidy for coastal homeowners. And after um, several years of work, both environmentalists and um, taxpayer low tax act, uh, activists, I'm not quite sure of the term, but they were conservative members. Uh, we, Congress passed the law to revise that program and set market rates at a certain time, date certain. Well, it turns out, I think it was Tad Cochran, a leader in the state Senate, had a house, has a house on the, on the Gulf Coast, and the next year they repealed the bill. So um, I, I think that, that, that that's a challenge. Um, I think with the insurance industry, what we've talked about that for several years, and what we hear is that the retail insurance industry operates on an annual basis. If the risk is too great, they just won't reinsure. Where there is traction is on the international level with the reinsurance companies because they, they buy these, they bundle these policies. So they actually have climate risk. And, and there's a new group that's been meeting since the, the Paris COP um, around insurance trying to figure this out. In terms of relocation, I'm trying to avoid the term managed retreat. Um, I'm open for ideas, but it's very, very um, controversial. Uh, it can be very expensive, uh, and it gets into uh, issues of social equity, especially in other parts of the world. You know, who, who moves, who tells who when they have to move, uh, who pays for that, where do they go? Uh, we have climate refugees from Louisiana whose, whose land is, is gone. Uh, they have moved. Uh, they've had to move. There are climate refugees in the Indian, uh, in the Asia, um, in Asia Pacific that are stranded, looking for a new home. So this is an issue that we have not dealt with uh, yet, and uh, that's going to become more prevalent. Yes, uh, uh, please wait for the mic. Uh, the, uh, grab the mic. Uh, oh. Yeah, Hi. thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for this panel and for this event. Uh, my name is Alice Hill. Uh, I am currently with the Hoover Institution. And just on this issue of coastal resilience, managed retreat, uh, for those of you here on the Stanford campus, on September 18th and 19th, the Hoover Institution, Stanford Woods Institute, as well as the Wilson Center based in Washington, DC, are going to have a uh, conference focused on this issue as it relates primarily to California, uh, also to the East Coast, but since we're here in the uh, West, we'll do that. So I just wanted to let everyone know if this is an issue. It is uh, highly controversial, very politicized, but the reality is there will be many people migrating as a result of sea level rise. Hmm. September 18th and 19th. Yeah, the announcement went out yesterday. There you go. I see a hand up here. And if you introduce yourself, that helps us get to know each other. Hi, I'm Ben Davenport with the city of San Leandro. Um, Ms. Fox, I was interested in the model where you were showing natural gas usage increasing or not. I'm curious what inflection points you guys found, so what price associated, and uh, do you see any, you know, uh, if there were, say, a carbon tax, wh what would that need to be at? Mm. Um, so on the carbon tax piece, I don't know if we've done that kind of variable within the model, um, but I could go back and certainly check on the, that variable if you had a carbon tax and you know how that's attributed to these different fuel types, coal, gas, wind, solar, all of that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that's not included in here would be subsidies. So if there's subsidies for renewables, for example, um, that's not something that's sort of included within this. So in terms of the just, and you can go online, you can use this uh, model. I put on my slides a, a link to the model. It's called Regen. 
you can go and, and uh, kind of play with it a little bit um, with what you want to consider. The, the two scenarios I gave were simply to just demonstrate the pretty big swing in projected fuel mix of the future, and that was just you know pivoting one variable in that case. It was the price of natural gas, which does seem to be you know aside from subsidies and um, and clean power plan and regulations and all of that. If you just look at the economics of it, so if you're a company and you're sitting there making a decision on what you're going to do with your assets, um, the price of natural gas is a huge. Um, uh, defining, you know, factor in terms of kind of where you're going, um, just on those pieces. Um, what we see, of course, is that examples, for example, like Norway, divesting of all their um, investments in coal assets in 2015. I don't know if you remember this; it was a pretty big deal. Norway divested of all their investments related to coal. Um, those types of things are major triggers here as well. So companies that were affected by that, that are based in the United States, power companies, you know, that, that was a big incentive aside from policy, aside from the price here. Um, and then demands of customers. Um, of course, you know, Guido mentioned Google, and it's just at the top of my mind. Of course, Google is 100% renewable. And other companies like that that say, if we're going to if we're going to locate in your service territory, we are requesting that you deliver us renewable power. So customers themselves are really showing a lot of. Um, Jim is so disruptive at these meetings. <laughs> Golly, the leader. <laughs> um, so these kind of stakeholder and customer demands. Are, are really influencing this. So that was part of my point too, is regen is one model based on some, some considerations and variables, but this is, you know, there's a lot of other variables, investor, shareholder, you know, expectations, customer expectations. The piece about water resiliency, we haven't hit on here at all. Um, water resiliency is a big, big, big deal. We know we hear about water, right? So this relates to land change. It's not just climate there on water, but it's land change. Um, demographic spread and urban growth, stormwater issues, imperv impervious concrete, those things. That's a piece that Upper Reduce does, is doing a lot of work on, is the piece about what's resilient related to water, which has an overlay of, of climate change, of course, but there's other things related to water that are actually, you know, m maybe more influential on on a terrestrial basis than just the change in temperature, once you get outside the polar ice cap melting issue. Yes, um, right there. Hi, uh, my name's Pam Doman. I'm at the California Energy Commission. I was just wondering about the fourth assessment. Um, can you talk about some of our partners uh, working on that? Yeah, so the California Fourth Assessment, as I said, is going to be released to the governor and the legislature in 2018. So our main partners are the, um, the California Natural Resources Agency. Uh, the Energy Commission is funding, is funding projects uh, on, uh, related to the energy system. The Resources Agency is funding projects about agriculture, uh, forestry, public health, um, all, of, all, all of the other sectors. Uh, we're also wor working very closely with the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. And the steering committee for the assessment is the CAT, I love CATs, so the CAT <laughs> Climate Action Team Research Working Group that is headed, is headed by our chairman, the chairman of the Energy Commission. So we have like 21 state agencies that are part of that a group that meets every month, once a month. Um, in addition, we have like, um, I would say like 30 research groups that are working on this. Uh, we have like 30 research papers that are coming out from this effort. In addition, some groups that already have funding, for example, from NSF, have uh, decided to align their studies with the California assessment to make it more comprehensive. Uh, in addition, for the first time, we are not only going to have uh, assessments for, for California as a whole, 
we are now moving to regional assessments. So there will be one for the Los Angeles region, there will be one for the Sacramento Valley, another one for uh, San Joaquin Valley. And one feature of the assessment is that we want local universities to lead each one of the regional assessments. So UCLA in the, in the, uh, for the Los Angeles region, you uh, see San Diego, the one for the San Diego, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a big effort. Uh, um, I, th I hope all of you will notice the results at the end. We hope to make a big splash, not only in the scientific circles that we have done in the past, but also uh, you know, let Californians know more and what we we'll try to do is to not only bring the bad message that everything is going to be bad, but also <laughs> how it stays, the state is preparing and getting ready for the expected changes. Um, Mr. Sinks. Is your cat named Loca? <laughs> <laughs> named after your model? <laughs> no? Um, my name is Rod Sinks. I'm a, a council member in the city of Cupertino, and I uh, am a founding chair of Silicon Valley Clean Energy. Um, I'd like to talk, have you talk a little bit about your views of the renewable portfolio standard and whether it needs expansion. Uh, what we've seen in energy markets is plummeting cost at wholesale of solar energy in California. Um, geothermal is relatively expensive. Uh, wind is very problematic for folks to build. There are issues with birds, we're told. So it's easy to get solar, but we know that we need baseline energy that's always on. Should the RPS grow to include, say, major hydro? And if, if not, uh, what else would you do? Would you expand Cal ISO's authority to include all of the Western grid as uh, other states would opt in? Would you? I uh, think we should be investing in storage to uh, hang on to all that solar until the uh, the duck curve, where we come out of the duck curve at the end of the day. What are your prescriptions for uh, California uh, lawmakers in uh, trying to make our energy supply uh, more resilient? And I would add that when we got our agency started, we elected to to choose a label of 100% carbon-free electricity for our customers. So we're doing that at a percent under PG&E's costs to our customers, rather than focusing on renewables. So, so our first message is carbon-free, and it, maybe is that the label we ought to be mm. hopping on, because 50% of what we're buying is, is big hydro. Thanks. Yeah, so your question is well about my paycheck. That's, that's the term mm -hmm. that we use. But I will give you my personal perspective. Don't take it as a California Energy Commission view of the state. Uh, so uh, in the research, I mean, I work in the research division. So I'm going to also give you my the perspective on the research point of view. So we are uh, funding studies looking at how the energy system should evolve not only to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time to lower or decrease the vulnerability of climate impacts. Uh, and we see multiple options to make it more reliable. Uh, uh, I mean, storage is, uh, I mean, one good option. Uh, the issue of hydro, uh, one of the issues is that in order to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we need also to electrify everything that can be electrified. Uh, so the net effect, according to our models, it hasn't infiltrated into the policy reports yet, is that the net effect is gonna actually be increasing demand of electricity in California. So with that, the contribution of hydro will diminish in percent, in percent terms. So it started uh, in the 70s, I think it was like 50% of the electricity in California came from hydro. Now it's about 15% in a normal year, and that percent is gonna uh, go down. Uh, we're also looking at urban renewables, you know, how to um, 
uh, so we're going to have a study looking at how to have uh, uh, urban renewables like solar uh, and uh, on, on others, biogas, in, inside the urban centers. Uh, the, there is also a possibility to integrate that with microgrids. Uh, that will help with the vulnerability of the energy system because the microgrids can isolate themselves if there are problems outside their, their territory. Uh, and at the same time, they could help with the uh, overall energy, uh, electricity system. Uh, so, so the bottom line is that what I'm trying to say is that we see multiple options to increase uh, the carbon-free supply of electricity. Um, I hope I at least attempted to answer your question. Yeah, I want. I, go ahead. I, I, just, just my personal view is I don't think we need to go to 100% RPS standard by law. Um, we have a 50% one now, um, and my understanding is the RPS is initially to stimulate market activity. Uh, we heard this several times today about the low, lower cost of renewables. And so I think the, the market's there. We've seen good job growth and, and all that. So, uh, I, but I, I, would, I, I would agree with you. I think we, we should shift the metric to, to greenhouse gas emissions. You know, what, is it, what, are, what, is the, what are the utilities putting out? That's the metric that we're using today uh, and for the future to, to uh, gauge our progress. So to me, that's more, more useful. Um, than the percent for renewables. Oh, hydro is not carbon free, just to be clear. Hydro has greenhouse gas flux associated with it, so that'd have to be you know, measured and considered in that too. Is that from plant growth in the water? What causes the height, the yeah, yeah, greenhouse yeah, there's, gas emissions? There's a bunch of studies on that that are out there. You know, yeah, the vegetation within the sediment flux within the system coming behind the dam and so forth. So hydro is not carbon free. So what, what's your prescription then? Oh, I don't that? have to have one because I'm not a regulator. <laughs> 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 I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm uh. a conservation biologist by training. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know. I know the hydro thing is huge though when you're looking at stability of renewables. So Hawaii has, a, ha, by 2045, they have to be 100% renewable. By 2045, it was mentioned earlier, right? And other states are looking, at, you know, looking to be aggressive, of course, California. So then if you're going to be there, how are you gonna have a stable supply of kilowatt hours every time you plug in, right? So that, that was one of your points that you referenced too. So the um, storage um, possibility of hydro is, is enormous. Some hydro plants can come online within 15 minutes, um, potentially. I mean, there's, there's huge potential for hydro to potentially be a backup. And companies, we were just talking to them earlier this week, um, they invested in new hydro versus battery storage. Um, other companies have invested in huge, this isn't a little battery storage, this is a huge amount of battery storage coming off of their solar fields. So this question about how do you keep the grid and those kilowatt hours stable is, is, a, is an enormous challenge. And it really hasn't been figured out yet. Companies are doing this, well shoot, we gotta be, be, meet our RPS goal or their voluntary target. For example, Exelon has a voluntary carbon target. In that case, they're, they're heavy, heavy nuclear. So um, is it carbon free? Yeah, it's carbon free. So that's some of the, the consideration here. So, you know, I can point to the trade-offs that you have to think about with these different, with these different issues. Um, but ultimately, you know, the economics, it's a combination of economics and the regulatory kind of box that you're put in that'll determine, you know, your path forward and how you structure your business. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, I just want to uh, hang on. I want to add, add to this as well. I think it's important to avoid the temptation to do value engineering and to look at each type of energy as its own special thing. So you could take something like geothermal and say it's providing baseload. Maybe per kilowatt, it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but it provides this extra service of smoothing out availability, or same with microgrids. A smart microgrid might cost a little bit more to set up, but it creates resilience. It creates resilience to things like earthquakes, which has nothing to do with climate change. So 
I think a value engineering approach is like, I, I used to work in the, in the automotive industry, and it's like you take a tractor and you look at each little part and try to optimize it, instead of thinking about the whole system of the, of the piece of equipment, or maybe even how it interacts with the, the approach to farming that you're taking. So I think the th same thing with energy system, we ought to be thinking about different types of energy together as, as a system, and what is the benefit that each of those types of storage, geothermal, hydro, um, solar, wind, all these different types of energy, how they work together, and think about pricing that system as a whole. You know, just as just as a comment on this too, the so this is this is a sort of a, a mini story. My son, he's going into high school next year. He did horrible in eighth grade, horrible in eighth grade, and I'm glad this is on video so he can watch it later. Um, so he, yeah, so. Um, and now it's publicly known. Um, so he, you know, he would come home and he's very, you know, into like, you know, my value system naturally. And so he didn't turn in his homework, at, you know, when he had essays due. And he'd say to his teacher, he'd say, well, I'm worried about the environmental impact of the electricity in my house. And the solar was already down, it was dark, and I didn't want to turn on my lights and computer to get my essay done. So I didn't do it. <laughs> okay, talk about, you know, hooking in, right, to value systems and hearing all this conversation at home, right? But this thing about what the customer expects, especially the next generation, it's no joke. Generation Z is looking for places to work and products to use that align with their value system. So aside from regulations and us adults sitting here talking, those next people are coming up and an enormous amount of economic dollars is transferring to Generation Z within the next 20 years. And they're gonna be making their own investment decisions. So let's not leave the whole childhood education thing totally off the table here. It's extremely, extremely important as we take the long view of this transition to a more resilient future. Margarita. Hi, my name is Margarita Colmenares with Global Water Farms, we're a startup uh, for desalination using primarily solar power. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have a 16 year old. I actually wanted to talk about climate change education because uh, early in, uh, in another workshop, just right before this one, there was a slide that really grabbed my attention. And it was one that showed the number of extreme heat days from the baseline to say 2050s, 2080s. And it was a very simple graphic, but one that I feel that would really help those that part of our population that doesn't believe in climate change internalize it and really start to understand this. I know that there's some countries, maybe Denmark, I can't remember, that post like as part of their nightly uh, news broadcast, like how much renewables or how much, uh, mm. in other words, it's present more in people's minds. And, and I'm wondering what ways California, or if you have any ideas on how we can get these messages out to a broader public I'd love to see, for example, uh, Governor Brown issue a similar invitation to entrepreneurs, since mm -hmm. California is a leader, uh, to come here, you know, like the French president did. Mm -hmm. So real quickly on that, the, um, the chair of the Public Utilities Commission, Michael Picker, mm -hmm. went to Washington, D.C. Um, in February and stood outside of US EPA with a sign uh, inviting EPA scientists to come work in California. <laughs> I, I realize we're nearly out of time. Is that right for my timekeeper? OK, maybe we're a little bit over. So that gets to be your last comment. <laughs> Jessica, wrap up comment from you. Um, I, I, think I, I think I'm good. Yeah, thank you. Your son thanks you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, well, I think the uh, higher penetration of renewables is a technical issue, that, but I think it will, it's going to be resolved in one way or another. So I will not be too, I mean, at least I'm not too concerned, uh, but I'm an optimistic, I'm also an engineer that thinks that everything can be solved with technical solutions. Mm -hmm. And I want to I want to thank our panel and also thank all of you for looking into the future and thinking about what are our vulnerabilities and and then really how are we going to allocate capital to address those vulnerabilities and I think there have been some 
vulnerability analyses being done by different departments of the state and by utilities, but the investments to address those vulnerabilities have not really been made yet. So there's a big business opportunity there and there's a big risk that if we don't make those investments, we'll keep getting hit with emergency after emergency and that will suck away a lot of capital and energy and, and create a lot of damage. So I think this is a really important issue and I'm very grateful for all of you for being here to discuss it with us. Thank you.